wrote to council and have had them change their bylaws so that women could start uh, and study at the AA. And it's wonderful that today uh, there's 50% women uh, studying here, but the problem lies when people graduate uh, and somehow that 50% is uh, diminished to something like 21% who are registered architects. And uh, there's a 25% pay gap. And we need to do something about this. This is against the law. Uh, we need to uh, be active in making objections when there are all male panels, uh, when women's voices are not heard. And as part of the AAXX project, what we found is an amazing number of really distinguished women. And their stories are not there. If you look on Wiki, they're not there. Well, actually, since last week, or was it two weeks ago, a few more are there, but most women are not there. Uh, and when they came to the AA, they played a very active role in all the events that happened here. And there was a suggestion that they should run a, a course in interior design here. And there was great objection to that because women here did not want to be pigeonholed into those things that were traditionally seen as female. They wanted to make it on the same footing as their male peers. And um, here's a list of some of the significant early uh, graduates. Some of them, like um, uh, Blanca White, didn't use used her middle name, Justin, because to make it appear that she wasn't a woman. The number of women who have been very successful whose, whose name is Pat is quite interesting. Um, and of course, this week, the whole passport saga uh, is very much um, comes home because Elizabeth Scott was a student here. And please sign the petition for uh, having more women uh, or having women equally represented. But this isn't just about women, it's about getting a fair, having a fair go at getting projects and being recognized on an equal basis. Of course, we can't do it on our own, and this isn't to the exclusion of men, but it's about the inclusion of women. And um, it's no good thinking that this is an issue that Ruth Lowy faced. This is an issue we are facing. It, it's outrageous to think that the BBC uh, last year airbrushed Patty Hopkins out of the picture. And the reason that was given was it just didn't look right. I mean, it was pathetic, the reason that was given. Um, but, you know, I have to say, where were we objecting? How many of us wrote to the BBC? How many of us went and paraded there? How many of us went on hunger strike? <laughs> well, um, so, uh, and, and um, Last night, uh, there was a lovely article in the, in the Guardian, uh, sorry, in the Evening Standard, uh, about, you know, it's time to write women into history. Uh, they've been left out, even though they've done amazing things. And the uh, AD, in 1975, ran a survey, Monica ran a survey, and we've embellished it a bit, uh, but you'll find on your seats there's um, a survey that I would like you to fill out. Uh, and that's everybody, including men, <laughs> who are here. And um, we, we'd just like to find out what's happening and how people see things moving forward. So we really would like your um, response on this. So please don't bin this bit of paper. Please fill it out and give it back to me. Just put it on, on the front. And uh, as Pauline's already mentioned, uh, as we're very lucky to have her as a leadership coach, um, so do, do um, talk to her and make use of her talent because um, uh, it's wonderful that she's here. And the other opportunity that I wanted to flag up, when we were doing the his, uh, when we were going through some of the very eminent women at the a uh, early women at the AA, we discovered there was one woman who got a Legion d'honneur. And then she got a nervous breakdown here. And you kind of think, wow, how can a woman who got a Legion d'honneur end up with a nervous breakdown here? So it was tough for women here. This was no easy ride. 
Um, and so, so we, I think we have a responsibility to do something and to share opportunities and to, to help other women um, get ahead. So here is an opportunity. It's a, 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 an opportunity to go and do some drawing up in Cambridge with some very interesting AA people. Um, and yeah, so I'd encourage students to go. The bookshop has put on a special display and there's lots of books on women architects um, there. Uh, and of course, um, uh, I'd encourage you to publish your own work as well. But we've got a very, very rich day ahead of us. Uh, and I, today came about because um, at a council meeting, Brett Steele said, oh, well, we've got a number of anniversaries coming up. And <clears throat> one of the anniversaries is the anniversary, the centenary of women at the AA. And because I'd just written an article for the AJ for Christine Murray, who's been a great champion, uh, I felt sort of this ought to be something I ought to take on. So it's been a project that's evolved in that way. We've had wonderful support. Um, there have been student assistants who've been appointed. Uh, there's been staff, alumni, um, and lots of people are, are sort of gathering. It's, it's like a little seed that's now sort of rolling and, and, and gathering uh, a lot of momentum. And you don't have to be connected to the AA to be part of this project. Um, and I'd encourage you to get your own universities, if you're not part of the AA, um, to be doing their own projects. We, we, we really need to catch up with the centenary of not being heard and not being seen. And as Virginia Woolf would say, we've been angels in the office. Uh, and it's about time we killed that angel and rose up and stood on, on our own feet and recognised our own talents. Um, and the person whose idea it was to mark 40 years of, of AD is Eva, um, who will be talking uh, later today. Eva, do you want to just stand up and <laughs> so people know <laughs> who you are? And, um, uh, and uh, without uh, Manuja, who's not here, but probably organising something out there, uh, and uh, Eleanor Gorn, who's the librarian upstairs, really today would have been very, very difficult. So I'd like to thank them very much. But of course, without the support of council and without um, people helping at the very top, things at the very bottom don't uh, become very difficult. And I was really delighted that Paul, who is the president of the AA, uh, came, came on board in June, July, I've forgotten, anyway, this year, June. Uh, Paul is, has um, got a very distinguished career as a researcher as well, uh, as well as an architect. He's worked internationally in Malaysia, uh, has uh, trained at the AA, and, um, and we both share the same tutor because Ingrid Morris was also one of my tutors, and I'm expecting Ingrid later on today. Uh, so Paul, would you like to? Morning. Oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry. Number two. Um, Have we lost number two? Do we have a number two? Yeah, it was there. Okay, never mind. Do you have your USB? Or it doesn't matter. It's not that one. Yeah, it's this one. Morning. First of all, this wouldn't have happened without Yasmin. Um, I need to thank her uh, for being the force behind this. And of course, um, I welcome you all here on this uh, wet, windy, warm November morn. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, we are about to celebrate, we're on the eve of being in this, these row of buildings, 
for 100 years and uh, women in the AA for 100 years. Um, and as there are almost 20 presentations today, I will be rather brief, but there's a couple of things I want to say. Um, as Yasmin hinted, the, the AA actually now is a girl power school. There are more girls than boys here. Um, there are, in fact, just under 400 men and just over 400 women here. Um, in fact, there are 38 more girls than boys. And I use the term girls and boys a bit lightly because um, council has to sign off uh, all diplomas, dissertations and qualifications. And this last Monday, we signed off a dissertation from a boy, I might add, that was first submitted in 1971. So <laughs> um, I say I use the term rather loosely. Um, but girl power is good, but according to Jane Duncan, I wasn't sure if Jane was going to be here today. Um, the real problem is that only 12% of um, uh, architects in leadership in the UK are women, um, despite almost parity in a lot of schools for uh, student numbers. <clears throat> and we probably all know that um, that women represent less than a quarter of the FTSE 100 directors. Um, and when you count executives, the statistic is, is much, much lower. So I'm sure today you'll hear lots of statistics about um, um, inequality, about equal pay, women in lesser roles. Of course, these are important. But for me, they're not as important as what are socially acceptable work patterns. It must have been about 10 years ago at the, um, uh, I gave a presentation at the British Council for Officers on uh, what is work. And uh, my talk focused on the contribution that women give to their families, to society at large, um, regarding childcare and looking after the home, which, which often includes the elderly. And there are very traditional customs still in the UK entrenched around uh, what is work. So my major point, I think, and this, this I think is fundamental, we need to make paternity leave not just a right, but an expectation, normalise um, paternity leave. It would be worth it if we can make both men and women see that um, work at work and work at home are shared equally. Yasmin's already mentioned the film Suffragette. I haven't seen it yet, um, but it launched, I got here on the 8th of October uh, in London, and Meryl Streep, who stars in the film, was interviewed the next day on Radio 4. And she said, at last, the majority of men are getting it. They are real realizing that equality for women is their problem too. Up until recently, most men thought <clears throat> that equality for women had little or nothing to do with them. But things are now changing. I think, however, on a global scale, there is a lot to be done. And also recently at the Global Citizens Festival in New York, President Obama stated, this was, this was I think I said in September, um, stated that globally 62 million girls do not get any form of formal education. This has to change. But finally, um, I spent a lot of time in the 80s, the end of the 80s in Italy, and I came across the name uh, Veronica Franco, and I don't know if you've heard of Veronica Franco. Um, she was part of the Venetian court in the late 16th century. And I'll sort of paraphrase a famous quotation of her, where she says, when we too are armed, armed, same as men, and are able to fight until death, but remember this is the 16th century, Trying to find the quote again. 
we will set an example for them to follow. The fight has been going on for at least 500 years, but I think equality is getting closer. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'd like to introduce Helen Castle next. Uh, Helen is the editor of AD. She also is responsible for commissioning um, work in America as well as Britain. So if you want anything published, now is your chance to nab her. And um, Helen um, got an MA at the Bartlett uh, in um, the history of modern architecture. And um, she's an amazing person. The um, uh, issues of AD that have uh, come out under her editorship uh, have been um, really very lively and she's included a lot of women um, uh, as guest edi editors and I'll, I'll leave you to look that up on, on the web. Helen, welcome. Good morning. It's uh, good to see such a good turnout this morning um, on a very, very wet Saturday morning. Everyone's got out uh, and walked along in the rain along Tottenham Court Road. So um, it's greatly appreciated to see you all. 40 years ago, in 1975, the initiative for the Women in Architecture issue of AD came directly from the AA. In her editorial, the long-standing editor, Monica Pigeon, describes how she agreed to dedicate the August 1975 issue to the subject egged on by young women libbers at the AA and her colleague, Barbara Goldstein. So it could not be more fitting that the AA XX 100 group have organized this event today, making it part of their celebrations to mark the centenary of the women at the AA. I want to say a particular thank you at this juncture to Yasmin Sharif. I think she's already been described as the driving force behind the, ev the event. She's really spearheaded it. She's organized it and made it happen. Going back to that phrase of Monica's women's libbers sums up a whole other era in a single breath. It's such an immediate throwback it evokes a time of lively, strident student politics, passionate feminism, and bra burning. It's the, it's, it also sums up that there was a very, very clear remit and a clear feeling from people that things had to change. The reference to young libbers also signals, signals Monica's own remove from a vital, much younger movement. As she pointedly states in her editorial, it had never previously occurred to her to take a stand about women in architecture. In 1975, Monica was in fact 62. She was a formidable female presence in the architectural world. A significant proponent of post-war modernism, she'd been editor of AD for 30 years and developed it into an internationally reputed magazine. She'd promoted the likes of CIM, Le Corbusier, Goldfinger, and the Smithsons. As a working mother, Monica had, in her own words, in the editorial, muddled through. Just, to, I'd like you to all to think about the power, though, of women muddling through. It really shouldn't be underestimated. It's the women chipping away with their heads down that affects change, enables success, and creates influential role models. It does not have to be pointed out that one of the most renowned architects in the world today is a woman, Zaha Hadid. She set up her own practice in London in 1979, but had to muddle through and muddle on for 16 years. She received her first major building commission the Vitra Fire Station in 1993. In 2016, she'll be the first woman in her own right to be awarded the RIBA gold, Royal Gold Medal in 2016, in recognition of a lifetime's work. As a gold medal win winner, Zaha will be joining the ranks of Frank Gehry, 
Norman Foster and Frank Lloyd Wright. In the last six years, the RIBA has appointed three women presidents, Ruth Reed, Angela Brady, and Jane Duncan, the current president. In the US, women have made significant inroads into architectural education and leadership positions. There are now some 30 women deans of architecture schools, and in fact, that number is growing. The most prominent Ivy League schools have in the last three years all appointed women. Amalie Andreas at Columbia University took up her place in 2014. Um, Monica Ponche de Leon, who is taking, is taking up her place at Princeton in January 2016. And Deborah Burke is replacing Bob Stern at Yale in July 2016. Is all that muddling through enabling a critical mass? we have to ask ourselves, could we be possibly at a watershed moment for women in architecture? Or possibly not. In 1975, Nadine Beddington reported in AD that women only make up 6% of the total membership of the RIBA. So where would you expect us to be now, 40 years later, with the intake of female students at undergraduate level being approximately 50%? as Paul's just mentioned, possibly 35% or 40%. In 2014, the RIBA reported that a paltry 17.6% of its members are women. When recent, I'm gonna, I'm gonna again reference uh, Meryl Streep here. Not the same quote, but coming back to her again. When recently interviewed on the BBC about her new film, Suffragette, Meryl Streep commented that women's rights and women's issues are men's issues. When asked why she thought that women film stars are still paid less than male co-stars, she said it came down to the larger ecosystem, the decision makers who distribute films to the larger multiplexes. They still place traditionally male all action films at a premium over more feminine films with bigger roles for female actors. It's not really particularly logical when you think that actually there are more women in the population than men, but, but that's what happens. So just like female actors in the film industry, women architects are still operating in a wider male-dominated ecosystem that retains power over the decision-making. The wider construction sector, in which, which make up the property developers, um, the building contractors, engineers, um, in the UK employ only over 2.5 million people, of which only 11% are women, with a mere 1.2% of those making up manual labour trade. So the argument can't really be that it's because women can't do, this, do the same things physically as men. I have to admit that, like Monica, I have for the last 15 years as AD's editor and a working parent had a muddling through attitude. On AD, I've worked with some really fantastic women um, as Yasmin mentioned, guest editors, authors, and architects. I've not selected them because they are women, but because they're all individuals with important things to say or good work to show. These include veteran guest editor Lucy Bullivan, who I think is going to be talking later this morning. And she's guest edited three issues, one on housing and two on interactive technologies. And she's editing a fourth issue in January 2017 on the open source city. Karen Frank, an architectural writer, theoretician, and educator based in New York, also stands out for her long-standing contribution. She guest edited two issues on food and architecture and food in the city in the early 2000s, anticipating food as the next top topic. Her third issue on architecture and time and the impact of designing with time in mind is just about to go to press for publication in this January. AD, though, is as much about nurturing talent as spotting it already formed. We've been publishing Neri Oxman's work since 2016, sorry, 2006, um, when she was still at the AA. You probably, um, students here or faculty probably be aware of her work for that reason. But she's, that was before she headed off for stardom in the US and was lauded for her work as the director of the Mediated Matter Group at MIT. She's currently featured in a, in a mama show in New York and her own TED Talks. 
Neri's latest article on biology and design is in October's material synthesis issue, guest edited by Akin Menges. But as well as focusing on the work in hand, it is important to take a few steps back and look at the wider picture. This year, I appointed four new members of AD's editorial board. Claire Weiss um, from New York, Corey Sharples of Shop in New York as well, um, Kate Goodwin from the Royal Academy in London and Kester Rattenbury. To augment the disparity in the male-female ratio, we now have seven women board members, which include among them their number prominent architects, educators, writers and a curator. It's also why this event today is important, to give a proper amount of time to considering women's role in architecture, to lean in, to concentrate on ways that a new level of momentum can be achieved within the profession. Time has to be taken out from all that muddling through to take stock. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, just make sure I'm, I'm right on the order. Um, of course, I know it's Peter. Uh, I'd like to introduce Peter Murray. Peter is one of the most energetic, dynamic, incredible people I think I've ever met. Um, his skills are not only in editorial, but I discovered at wood turning as well. And um, uh, I'm sure you've um, been to the um, building centre where he runs the new London Architecture Centre, and it's very dynamic in the lectures and, and coverage that he manages to get. He attracts an enormous number of politicians. He's extremely influential. He's currently master of the Worshipful Company of Chartered Architects and, um, and leads on a number of fronts. He's also cycled from Portland Place to Portland in Oregon. And, um, uh, and I could go on, but we haven't got time. Uh, Peter worked with Monica, knew her very well, and I couldn't think of a better person uh, to be at today's event than Peter. Peter. Uh, I've got to get your um, presentation. Could I have a bit of help? Um, I'm not used to Max, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is number four. Gosh, well, it's a bit difficult to quite live up to that sort of introduction, but uh, I'll try. Um, yes, uh, Mon Mon Monica died in uh, 2009. She was aged 95. And uh, as you've heard, she was editor of AD from 1946 to 1975. And uh, I was uh, technical editor in the early 70s. Um, this actually isn't a picture of me, but it's a German architect showing Ken Frampton and Monica around a housing uh, pro uh, project that he'd done. And I, I use this photograph because I did look a bit like that in those days. And um, <laughs> it, it also uh, shows uh, you know, Ken Frampton there, who was technical editor for a time. And uh, he was there early 60s. Before him was Theo Crosby, and after him was Robin Middleton. And the way that Monica ran things, she ran things uh, with an iron fist, really, but she gave us huge amount of editorial freedom in what we did. So the uh, sort of overall uh, direction of the magazine tended to be pushed um, sometimes against uh, severe resistance from Monica, in the direction of those uh, specific uh, technical editors at the time. So when uh, Theo Crosby was there, uh, the sort of high point of that period was the This Is Tomorrow exhibition uh, with uh, the, the Smithsons, Palozzi, and uh, St. John Wilson, a uh, key uh, cultural event of the uh, 1950s. And uh, uh, then, uh, uh, there are periods of major change within uh, thinking. We've heard about CM, uh, but also Team 10, and I'll come to that uh, in, 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 a, in a moment. Um, but uh, 
muddled through. Um, Monica didn't realize um, it wasn't muddling through. It, uh, and it, it is very moving to me to uh, now uh, talk about some of this in that I went to Monica's wake in her very nice house designed by Walter Siegel up on uh, Highgate West Hill. And uh, the, the, the terrible thing was that her family did not want to know anything about everything she was. Uh, I had to ring up Robert Elwell at the RIBA and say, quick, come up here. All her stuff is in a skip. Um, and uh, 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 Steve Tompkins, who lived two doors down, he managed to actually uh, extricate uh, the copies of AD uh, from the skip as well as they were gotten rid of. Um, and uh, luckily, Robert did uh, get there in time before the skip was removed. But I thought uh, what a, a, a tragedy it was and how um, Monica, to me, represents a massive lost generation of women, of uh, people of my generation's parents, uh, mothers who uh, were totally uh, uh, undervalued and underused in terms of the things that they were able to do. Monica uh, did rise above it but, uh, because Monica was actually a very tough cookie. She had to operate in a tough world. Um, she was, she was a, a very good photographer. She didn't write very much. Uh, this is obviously, as you can see, a self-portrait. And she used to uh, use, uh, early days, a uh, roly flex like this one, which actually changed totally. And I don't know if anyone knows the photographs of uh, Vivian Meyer in New York, who also used the roly flex, who, uh, which creates a very different relationship with your subject than uh, looking through a single lens reflex. And actually, her photography was much better when she was using this camera, when she used, it went to the more modern uh, form of, of photography. But it meant she kept a, a, a really good record of a lot of things she is uh, doing. A lot of the uh, uh, photographs ha have gone missing, but there is a huge uh, uh, collection now in the RIBA uh, through Robert Elwell's rescue, and there's being archived uh, at the moment. Some of them uh, have been catalogued, uh, but uh, I'll uh, show you a, a few of them. Um, but uh, this isn't one of Monica's pictures, but it, it, it shows uh, Wells Coates, who founded the uh, Mars Group, uh, Modern Architecture Research, in 1934 with people like Morton Shand, Max Wolf Fry, O. Varrup. Um, and uh, it, it sort of, this sort of represents to me the, the, the sort of big beasts of um, architecture at the, at, at the, in the sort of immediate post-war period, where having a private income and having gone to public school was a key part of your business plan, uh, and uh, they operated uh, very much within this sort of, uh, I might say, Hampstead uh, community, uh, which at that time in the post-war period was focused around the uh, Lawn Road flats. Uh, uh, this is inside the Mars bar, as you might expect, in, in, uh, in Lawn Road. And uh, this chap here is uh, Jack Pritchard, who was involved uh, with the development of it. And, uh, uh, this is uh, Philip Harbin, who was a famous chef at the time, who actually looked after food in the bar. But this was a focus of uh, uh, the, the sort of social group that uh, Monica moved in uh, after, uh, the, uh, uh, after the Second World War. And uh, I'll go through some of the more uh, architectural events that uh, took place. But, uh, of course, as a journalist, she managed to uh, uh, travel a lot. Um, she had been, uh, she was born in Chile, but came to the UK in uh, the 1920s. Uh, she uh, then trained at the Bartlett, where she did actually uh, take an interior design course, uh, but then before moving on to, to AD. So she was very international in uh, her aspirations, her views, and the, her... Uh, the people she met. So she traveled a lot, she enjoyed traveling, and as I say, had a very good eye for photography. And uh, this is the uh, Brussels Expo uh, uh, that she uh, photographed. She also photographed uh, uh, buildings uh, for publication. This is uh, Dennis Lasden St. James's Flats uh, of the uh, uh, mid 60s. And then uh, La Tourette uh, uh, in uh, 1959, she photographed that. She had a really uh, excellent series of pictures of that soon after it was completed. 
and uh, Ronchamp a little bit after it completed, but nevertheless, a, uh, uh, some uh, splendid photographs. They, in those days, taken of course with uh, hard film using uh, 400 ASA, uh, very grainy uh, uh, film, which gave these uh, contrasting uh, images that she enjoyed. Um, uh, maybe some, somebody else would. Now, I'm not sure if this is Nantes or, or Marseille. I think it, it's more like Nantes because there's a flatter plane there. But uh, anyway, the, the Unité uh, with uh, Corb. And uh, then a, a lot of uh, photographs in the collection of holidays and so on uh, that, uh, again, I think uh, show uh, high uh, quality of her eye. She was, uh, uh, her daughter married John Donat, the architectural photographer who was also a sort of key influence in that uh, uh, social and professional network that uh, we operated within. And here are um, a couple of the big beasts. Mies van der Rohe, when he came to London with uh, Erno Goldfinger, um, uh, again, she would uh, re record uh, these uh, events that happened, and they are all in the uh, collection at the AA. But this, this is the one that I find uh, the most fascinating uh, picture almost of all, really. This is the uh, CAM conference in Bridgewater, uh, 1947, uh, which looked at the whole rebuilding of Europe after the uh, Second World, the destruction of the Second World War, and it was really the whole focus of uh, the sort of socially driven uh, scientific modernism of that period. And uh, they're, they're all listed down here, but, but almost every uh, major architect of the period is in that group. Uh, and while uh, these other uh, ladies in the front are um, uh, wives, here you have Barbara Randall and Monica in the center here uh, as a key part of both the sort of organizing structure and also the uh, publicity machine that came out of it. Monica really uh, felt that her role of, as a journalist and as a magazine was to provide the voice for those who she actually believed would uh, uh, lead to a uh, better world, better life, better architecture. And at that time, she was uh, totally committed to the idea of scientific modernism, uh, the work of, uh, of Corb and Mies and... Uh, uh, and the whole role of uh, <coughs> CAM in the I international debate. And she spent a lot of time uh, uh, in meeting up with these. And these were all people then, when I, I was in the uh, office, would still turn up. Every, every time they came to London uh, to uh, visit, they would always come to the offices as a AD uh, for a chat. So uh, it was a great place to... Uh, be and to experience uh, uh, the uh, key figures of the post-war period. Uh, Corb didn't. Corb didn't come to London very often, but uh, this was in Hoddesdon. Hoddesdon was uh, uh, that CM8, and uh, here is Monica in the front row, and she was involved in the whole organisation of that. And uh, uh, you can see these. Um, you, know, you, you didn't go to conference centers, or uh, this was a, a, a Christian union um, ha a, a country house that they actually held this in. Um, and these sorts of environments were, were, where Monica really uh, sort of felt at home. But from, from my point of view, um, oh, uh, this is still Hoddesdon. Uh, this is uh, uh, Wells Coates here, Dennis Lasden there, Minette de Silva. Uh, one of the other key women uh, architects of the period, uh, based in Sri Lanka, and uh, Erno Goldfinger there. And uh, uh, this is uh, Corb, uh, photographed by Monica. Not quite sure what meeting that is. Uh, I put it in there because Monica always uh, suggested that uh, Corbusier was a misogynist. And I'm never quite sure why she thought that, but uh, uh, I, I think it was to some competition between her and Jane Drew and Minette de Silva, uh, both Minette de Silva and Jane Drew had well publicized affairs with uh, Corb. Um, but uh, the big event uh, was uh, Otterloo, uh, uh, 1959, and uh, this was when Team 10, who were the young Turks in Siam, the new modernists with a humanist agenda, um, the, the, the Smithsons, uh, so uh, if I can remember who all these are, so, uh, 
Peter Smithson is somewhere in there, uh, but his, his, his hair, he had different hair, so it's difficult to recognize him. But uh, this is Alison Smithson here, uh, Bakema there, uh, Candilis, I think that one is, uh, Shadrach Woods, uh, Kenzo Tangi is, 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 is there, and Jen De Carlo is uh, somewhere in here. No, I think that's Jen De Carlo there. So um, these were the sort of key, uh, uh, as I say, young Turks of the time. They overthrew the uh, Corbusian modernists at uh, Otterloo uh, in uh, uh, 1959 and created Team 10. And Team 10 really drove the agenda for uh, AD right through uh, the, the 1960s. We covered other, other, other subjects as well, uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the Smithsons were, were a key figure. And then when I joined the magazine, uh, they were uh, in the office almost weekly uh, and discussing issues. And uh, particularly, I remember the, the, the publication of uh, Robin Hood Gardens, which uh, uh, Alison particularly saw as a, a, a key shift away from uh, the sort of large uh, uh, council estates of, 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 of the period. And uh, it doesn't quite uh, ring true in terms of the way it came out at the end, but uh, she would talk about the, the short, narrow street of the slum succeeds where spacious redevelopment frequently fails. And it's interesting to look at the current debate about Robin Hood Gardens in the light of, 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 of her thinking. So I'd say these are the sort of environments where Monica really uh, was at home. Uh, she really I I enjoyed the social interaction and, and the debate. She was a very social person. This is uh, with Bill Howell, uh, the uh, senior partner of Howell, Killick and Partridge. And uh, uh, this is, as I remember her in the office, uh, a bit jollier than normal. She wasn't always that jolly. She was pretty tough to work with socially afterwards. She was great, but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, she should, could be... Um, quite difficult, and um, in terms of her attitude to women was quite interesting. I remember when I first arrived, we had a, 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 a secretary called Gillian Heiser, her name was, um, who spent most of the day in tears because Monica would pick her up on the fact that she had to, every photograph that came into the office, Gillian had to write a, a number and a reference on the back and fill it into a book. And every photograph that was sent out of the office, she had to do the reverse. And if she got it wrong, uh, God help Gillian, really. So uh, um, not an easy, easy person to work with on a, on a daily basis. But uh, when you got it right, then it was fine. Um, this was a very important uh, uh, sort of program that she got involved with. This is uh, Teddy Colick, the uh, mayor of uh, uh, Jerusalem, and he set up an international uh, committee uh, to uh, try and see how uh, Jerusalem should respond to the tensions of uh, that period, the mid-1970s, uh, very difficult both politically and in terms of uh, need for regeneration and uh, change. And uh, among that group was uh, Nicholas Pevsner, uh, Buckminster Fuller, uh, Louis Kahn, uh, very uh, eminent uh, group, and, uh, uh, but in the end, uh, because then Colic uh, moved on and obviously the political situation took over, not a huge amount came out of it, but uh, she was very excited to be involved with that, and this is her with, with Teddy Colic uh, in Jerusalem. Then uh, an, another very important uh, uh, stage, which, which might be more important if, again, politics hadn't got in the way, uh, that the uh, uh, Shah of Persia, as was then, Shah of Persia's wife, um, uh, 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 Princess Pahlavi, uh, she set up a project for a large library in uh, Tehran, and uh, it, that was one of the big architectural competitions of the period. And she then invited a whole uh, 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 group of uh, women architects to uh, come uh, to debate issues about women in architecture as a part of the program of uh, promoting uh, the competition. And uh, so there is Monica and uh, Minette de Silva again there. And, uh, and here is Monica at, uh, in Tehran, photographed with... Uh, uh, I think the three key women in uh, that environment that uh, I was working at the time, um, Alison uh, Smithson and Jane Drew. Jane Drew, uh, partner of uh, 
uh, Max Fry, both uh, uh, marriage partner and also uh, practice partner. Uh, they went off to uh, India to uh, help build the housing in Chandigarh for uh, uh, some period of time, did a lot of major projects in uh, sort of outreaches of what was still then parts of the British Empire, uh, and uh, uh, particularly uh, places like Nigeria, and actually developed some uh, uh, amazingly effective and uh, resilient forms of architecture for uh, tropical climates. So this is a work group in uh, Tehran as a part of that project. And uh, so I, 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 men I mentioned Bucky Fuller. Bucky Fuller was, uh, again, a key figure in uh, uh, Monica's thinking about architecture, uh, even in the uh, uh, 1940s. Uh, uh, AD was publishing uh, prefabricated projects by Bucky. Uh, Monica was involved in the organization of the uh, uh, UIA conference in the early 60s in London and also in uh, promoting the World Design Science Decade, uh, where um, Bucky Fuller rather optimistically thought that architects were going to essentially save the world. And he, the idea was to get architectural students all around the world researching um, uh, the uh, loss of, uh, uh, sort of problems with energy, problems with uh, 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 creation of materials, and uh, general sustainability issues, which uh, uh, you know, pretty commonplace uh, now, but that was a key piece of thinking in the uh, early uh, 60s, which then led very much to a whole movement here at the AA, uh, which then AD in the early 70s, when I was technical editor, was very much involved with uh, the whole uh, aspect of, uh, in those days, uh, we didn't know about CO2 emissions, but it was all about energy conservation, uh, solar energy, uh, green buildings, all that sort of thing, where the AA uh, under Jerry Foley was uh, very much the centre of thinking at the time, and, but something that uh, then dissipated as soon as we discovered North Sea oil. Uh, the uh, other person who was also uh, very important was uh, John Turner, um, who uh, then also ended up teaching at the uh, AA. Uh, he w had been working in uh, Lima, Peru, working on the Barriadas, where he was really the first person to uh, realize that the energy and enthusiasm of self-builders within uh, uh, poor economies uh, around the world uh, was a key, uh, uh, had, had, had the ability to provide uh, good housing. And it's, it's fascinating, you can go to Lima now, uh, developments they were working on are now resilient, uh, complete, and uh, functioning urban environments. Uh, and uh, they managed to build in an uh, area of Lima, outside Lima, uh, equivalent to uh, our docklands at about the same sort of period of time, exactly the same number of homes there by self-build means as uh, uh, we've been able to build using big business to do it. So. Um, uh, John Turner, because of the uh, sort of publishing uh, of in AD, then went on to be a key advisor to the World Bank, and he delivered uh, uh, projects uh, around the world during the uh, uh, 60s and 70s at, uh, uh, in all sorts of uh, uh, emerging e economies to uh, create better uh, uh, living conditions. And uh, then uh, uh, Cedric Price and Alvin Barsky, when he was... Uh, head here, we were, right, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll finish off in a moment. And uh, so this represents really a big shift. Uh, and this is uh, when I, I was at AD, we shifted away, uh, might say, from the ho heroic period of uh, fixed architecture into thinking about uh, issues to do, as I say, sustainability uh, with Cedric flexibility, uh, relationship of architecture and time, and all sorts of uh, uh, different sort of issues. Archigram were a key part of that debate that happened uh, in Bloomsbury Way, where our office was at the time. And uh, there was, uh, you know, I, we all, in the office, we spent as much time here as we uh, did there, really. And other women at the time, uh, this is when Monica then moved to uh, become editor of the RIBA Journal. Um, and uh, this is the RIBA Bill in the background. This is uh, Wendy Foster, uh, a key uh, 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 figure in the uh, architecture of uh, the uh, 70s and early 80s. And then again, Rosamond Julius, who ran the Hilly Furniture Company, a uh, very key figure in the debate about design. Uh, and 
then these are a whole series of portraits that Monica took when she started doing what she called port pigeon audio visual, where she uh, realized that all the conversations we had with all these key figures were somehow uh, getting lost, dissipated. She started recording them with uh, tapes and slides, and uh, uh, she uh, interviewed uh, quite uh, uh, a number of uh, key women figures during that period, from uh, you know, Martha Schwartz, uh, uh, Zaha, young Zaha, Eva Jurichner, uh, and uh, that uh, formed a basis for a whole archive of uh, uh, conversations with uh, people, which uh, she then uh, asked me to look after uh, as she was getting beyond the ability to produce it. So uh, we then uh, digitized uh, all, her, all the talks that she had recorded. We're adding new ones on at the moment, but uh, you can go and see under uh, pigeondigital.com, uh, you can see her conversations with a lot of the key figures that I've just been talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I don't know if um, any of you noticed, I'm just gonna take it back to that picture of uh, Archigram. Most of you know the blokes in that picture. How many of you can name the women? Because they were part of it, and they are not no, there. No, <laughs> That's cheating. You know who they are. <laughs> but uh, so that was a, a wonderful over overview of um, AD and, and has given us tantalizing uh, insights into some of the issues and, and um, uh, the very rich uh, life that Monica Led. And I'd just like to pick up on a couple of things that you um, um, touched on. And one was to do with social concern and the ecological um, issues. And this is a theme that uh, in the research that we're doing on AXX seems to be coming through a lot. Um, I've been doing some research on Mary Crowley and uh, her work was very much powered by a, a social concern. And last year we had Julia King speaking, and her work is very much powered by social concern. So it's really interesting that it goes back um, uh, that far. But we're now, now going to move to, um, uh, Eva's going to, has interviewed uh, Barbara Goldstein. Barbara Goldstein uh, lives in LA, so uh, we, we couldn't bring her, her here physically. But um, we've done, Eva's done a Skype interview uh, and, um, and she's going to um, uh, talk about it. So Eva, Eva is, is an uh, assistant professor at um, Valencia University. She's been a very powerful force in, in helping us to organize events for AAXX and uh, has been absolutely fa fabulous, Eva. You're better at this than I am. I'll, I'll leave you to. Yeah. Uh, choice the presentation. Uh, I think that's that's. What's the name of that one? Uh, yeah, no, you have to say it. It's Barbara. Uh, <coughs> Uh, that one, sorry. Good morning. First of all, I have to excuse my English, my Spanish English. It's very brave from, from me speaking in English here today, but uh, apologies. Um, first of all, I have to thank you, ADA, AA, Yasmin, for the opportunity or the chance to be here today speaking at on a topic so important for me, like a work of women. Um, this is my name. I, I work with my partner in life in architecture. We have a small practice and we teach at the university. And I, I was born here. And my mother and me agreed to come to study there. So uh, it was an important event for me in my life and we were all aware of the importance of studying and uh, asking for what we thought it was important for us. So when that arrived to my hands and I thought we had to speak about that, it was normal for me. Um, 
My husband and me felt in that way, not only me, with a heavy load of work we have to do each day to combine all the things we want to do. And of course, we thought mm, women were underrepresented in history of architecture. Um, Jasmine, we met, I don't know really how, but finally we met, and she asked us to work on, on these contents. And first, uh, we found that Monica Pigeon was the, uh, the person working there, and Barbara Goldstein was the associate de deputy editor. We began to see how many ways she has done here, the contents, of course, the importance of the contents, the importance of the interviews, and the importance of the uh, survey. Uh, we can see here Barbara Goldstein. If we uh, make it a bit bigger, we can see about what she said at that moment. She continues saying that. Uh, she was from New York and what she studied. She worked in the AA and studied in the AA, and she worked in AD from uh, March 1973. Things she did here, she did the briefly, of course, all the, com all the study for the magazine, but precisely this briefly on books. Uh, the interview that I think is an important way of showing the work of women, asking them what they want to say. And the roundup, and this roundup, and the intervention of inert, inert, inert way of doing the issue. So before asking her, we are going to see the video. Before asking her uh, in the video, we work in some questions. And in, that's the second one, but it's more general than the first one. Uh, we asked her uh, about her background and how she entered in AD. And here is Peter Murray's name. So they, present, they introduced to Monica Pizion and began to work on that kind of issues. For us, it was important to know about the, um, the way the survey came out. And when I ask her, she always say Monica, 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 Monica everywhere. Of course, they began, she says, she asked Monica to publish because of the women years. It was the International Women Year. And what is important for me in, in this part of questions is that the art uh, director, usually Bob Kingsley, it was Johan Kaplan. Maybe Peter mind remember that? I don't know. Because she's not in the credits in the beginning of the, uh, the issue. But um, Barbara says constantly that Johan Kaplan was responsible for the art direction of the issue. That w is spectacular, I think, in the way it's uh, worked. In another question, uh, that are all for you if you want to see more, uh, it was important for me that uh, uh, um, Barbara said that Monica didn't consider her, herself as a feminist, and she didn't really think it was a great idea to begin with. And that moment, uh, as Peter said, uh, though the students and the ambience in that moment was a feminist wave. Uh, she didn't consider herself as a feminist, but she was for women. So we have to think on, on that point. And on ask, uh, ask her for the survey, the two questions later survey that is uh, really brilliant. Uh, Monica, Monica, Monica. All, all the idea of the survey comes from Monica, who didn't thought of herself that was a feminist. So uh, we continue asking different uh, questions. Uh, she says, oh, again, Joanna Kaplan, I would like to know more about this point because I, I think it's important question that. And uh, here we have the extracts of letters. 
uh, Monica says that Barbara Goldstein is the person with a, a group of women from the AA who uh, put forward the issue and the questions, the survey that they sent 100 letters to maybe all the quantity of women architects in Britain, but only 18 asked. Some of them, today here, Santa Raymond asked the question. So we have done the survey for thinking about next issue. We have more than two questions, but uh, these are general questions, and these, are, these follow the path of Monica Pigeon. You can find more information here. And I wanted to, before uh, watching the video, I wanted to recall on any Caldicott opinion uh, here. Although there are, well, there are, are very few well-known women architects, and it makes the point that there are few male architects who are well-known either. I would like to realize what we consider well-known on architecture. The profession as a whole, is a other question we have to think about what is the profession as a whole. I will, ask, I will speak about that in the second presentation. Is camouflage from the public eye. Uh, what, what the meaning of camouflage is, why we think that people do not understand what architects do, I feel not understood by the main parts uh, when I speak about architecture, people understand many things, but not architecture. What we think uh, we are well known, what is well known? Because we as women know that we are not in the same way as, women, as men are. So uh, in the issue, we can also find these shoes or feet. Uh, and I asked Barbara what is what it, and she said that when they were composing the pages, the columns were, had to adjust to the text, and they used these draws to um, fulfill the, the blank spaces in the composition of the titles uh, of the issue of the pages. Uh, so I love that drawings because they are for a person, uh, Gail Boyajian, I think, because it's the name on the issue. And they, are, they show diversity, they show fashion, but they show action, people beginning to walk. And I think that's what uh, Barbara made on, with this issue at that time. So the video, excuse my English because my English is terrible there, but uh, if it takes eight, 28 minutes. Maybe we can cut in the middle whenever you want. This video is from October 21st. else together or whether it's gathering places where people can play music and dance and display their art to me that's the heart of the Jane okay. yeah. how did you decide to do this issue on women in architecture um, I was aware of the fact that it was International Women's Year and the issue of women in architecture was very important to me. I talked with Monica about it, and although she did not feel that she was a feminist, she reluctantly agreed that it might be a good idea to create an issue on women in architecture. Um, uh, did you know Monica Pigeon well? Uh, did you know which relation she had with the women architects at that time, or if she admired any one of these women architects? She knew all the women architects in England that were prominent, and she did admire several of them, Jane Drew and Wendy Foster and Alison Smithson in particular. But, for example, Alison Smithson has only one article on Kuwait Gardens, but she didn't contribute to the interview, if I'm not yes, wrong. Yes, that's and correct. And yeah. do you know why? 
Yes, I do know why. Alison Smithson always wanted to be the center of attention, and she did not want to be considered among other people, and she certainly did not want to be considered as a woman architect. She wanted to be considered as an architect on her own and did not want to be associated in any way with a group of other women because I think she felt she would be marginalized if she was considered as a woman architect. And do you think that was the general feeling at that moment by other women architects? No. No. Alison Smithson is a person who had very strong views about things and definitely stood apart from other people. Vaya. And uh, the rest of the women that were contributing to the uh, issue, uh, Jane Drew, and Kate McIntosh, uh, they were convinced that the importance of this issue and the need of doing this? Absolutely. Everybody else participated very willingly. Okay. And why did you decide to do precisely in August? Because you told me the other time that this was the silly issue or the silly well, man. Um, we decided to do that issue because it, the, when we started working on it, it coincided with um, the announcement of International Women's Year. Monica felt that it should happen then because that was the time when the two men in the office were going on vacation. And we were able to put the issue together entirely with women in the office and a woman that we brought in, Joanne Kaplan, to do the art direction. Um, when I said that, um, that, that Monica announced it as the silly season, it was because the August, in August there are very few um, people that are not on vacation. And the newspapers tend to have articles that are frivolous in nature or silly. And when we had the press conference, because Monica always felt very ambivalent about the idea of doing a women in architecture issue. When we had the press conference, she, she um, minimized what we did by saying that we were doing this as the beginning of the silly season. I, I felt it was quite insulting, but that's the way that she felt about it. She also had us all dress in white for the press conference as if we were Vestal Virgins. <laughs> <laughs> you told that the other time, and and I didn't realize it. finally the press conference took place or not. But you are saying that it took place, even though yes. it was August, and, yes. and that Monica minimized the importance of the work. So it, w right. it was um, funny, at least, because you did a lot of work to do this issue. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it uh, impressed me when I see the contents. I, I was reviewing for uh, to think about this interview today, and and any time I read the content, I find it more modern even today, because the selection of titles, articles, the way of showing that. Um, who was the person in charge of thinking about the issue and the content? Well, I think Monica and I really thought about it together. Monica? Monica and thought about it together. And, and how do you manage that uh, she made so good contents for the issue and to minimize the work you all did? Well, you know, the thing was that she knew a lot about what was going on. I had talked to a lot of students and we kind of brainstormed what would be important to include in the issue. And when we contacted the various architects and historians, a lot of really interesting things came to light. So the content was very good. The content of all of the issues tended to be very dense and, and rich. So it was really no different than other, any other issues. I just think that she was embarrassed by the idea that we should focus on women exclusively. And that was just her particular um, way of looking at the world. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so, um, if you had to do an issue today that it was mixing past and future, how, uh, on, on how could you focus to make the similar work today? Because uh, as we spoke the other time, the former time, um, uh, it's important to make people aware of women work. But uh, at the moment you decided this important work doing by important women architects, and today there are a lot of women important architects. So how yes. could you focus this issue today? I think that the focus of the issue today would really be on sustainability and um, community because I think that a lot of us are really thinking now more about the fact that it's important to have communities that include people of all ages and all income levels as a way of creating stronger interdependency and that that makes a more sustainable world and that it makes a world where people that are of working age and working abilities can work and not worry about things like the care of their children, the care of their elders, because the communities are more supportive of one another. And I think that that's a change that's happening worldwide and something that women can affect very strongly. So you could focus on sustainability and collaboration. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But you are an expert in arts and the focus on arts in this issue was important too. Not because the typography, the shoes that are appearing in the yes. all the issue. And finally the article by Jessica Strang on women in architecture, that is a kind of ironic way of looking at women in architecture with of the small photographs of right. women yes. in <laughs> columns or in sculptures yes. and so on. So from the point of view of art, how, did you, how could you focus today uh, the yes. issue? When I think about whole communities that are full of, um, that have a lot of interdependency, I always think about the arts as being the core of that because the arts are things that bring people together, whether it's culinary arts where people can share meals together or whether it's gathering places where people can play music and dance and display their art. To me, that's the heart of any community that c includes people of all ages. So you could continue considering art today in this issue? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, like uh, so sustainability, collaboration, and participation, and arts. Yes. Okay, nice to know that. I agree. Um, <laughs> In the past, in the past issue, how did you select the work from architects to show in the issue? Because it's well selected. I know that you are going to say that Monica did it, but maybe you could um, advise her how to uh, detect or feel what she could publish. I think that we were looking at things like um, the fact that, that women architects were focusing on issues like community building and, and communities that would include things like um, childcare and things of that kind. We also were very familiar with the work of, of, of women architects that were um, doing quite sensitive and interesting work. We had visited a lot of them and seen a lot of their work. So it wasn't too difficult to select the projects. So you were, I understood that you were in, uh, researching on energy um, uh, saving way of building? Or? Well, the, the issues that Monica was most interested in always were things like energy conservation, new technologies, and affordable housing. These were, were ideas that she was very focused on throughout the time that I knew her. And so the, we were aware of those issues 
and the work, people that were working in those areas as part of the normal work that we did. So selecting women artists, architects that did that kind of work was not too difficult. But I, reviewing the issue, I didn't felt what you are saying now, because many of the buildings are hospitals or important buildings, some industrial services. So uh, which one would you say that was focused on that particular point of view? Um, there was one, you know, I haven't looked at the article, the um, issue in several months now, but um, there was one uh, article that focused on a woman that was creating um, a co uh, a kind of um, uh, a collaborative community um, that was dealing with childcare and that kind of thing. I can't remember exactly which art architect it was. Nina West Holmes, for example. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. Yeah, Nina West. Yeah, yeah. It was excellent. Yeah. So. Um, uh, other issue is the survey. We, we can read at the beginning the selection of two questions. Mm -hmm. We are involved now in finalizing our own survey today. How did you manage to decide which questions you were going to ask? I, you know what, I really can't remember, but I think that it was a situation where we talked a lot about what we thought the key issues were, and then we came up with the two questions. Yeah, it really came out with the two questions, but the way of asking only two questions and sending my letter to 100 women architects in the uh, United Kingdom was really intelligent because uh, it was a focus way of doing a survey. Yeah, well, so, you know, 40 years ago, as you know, we didn't have internet and, <laughs> of and phoning, telephoning to 100 people would have been quite difficult. I think that what we were trying to do was to find the most open-ended questions we could so that people could fill in the blanks with, with, with the, their own thoughts. And I think that in terms of finding the architects, we looked for everybody that we could find that fell into the category of a woman that was working in architecture. Um, I think that's a good place to stop. Um, Thank you. We are going to upload this interview to a link. So if someone wants to see, to watch it completely or to ask questions to make another video, that open to continue this research because there are a lot of open questions as we have mentioned before and anything else. Thank you very much. Um, we've, we've got a, a short coffee break. There's coffee available um, in the room on, the, on my right hand side. Um, if you feel like taking a break, the loos are downstairs, but they're also loos um, by the bookshop further down in the corridor there. Are there some, some other loos somewhere nearby? Yeah, well, just ask, I'm sure um, people will um, direct you. And, um, but we will be starting promptly at quarter past, so you've got um, 15 minutes. That was 20 past. 20. 